All right, well, we'll get started. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for the weekly town hall series that Exit Advisors has been hosting now for several months. Uh, it's We've had some really great participation and some very interesting topics. Um, really appreciate you coming out. Um, today we'll be featuring Gary Cooper again. This will be the, the continuation and second part of his uh, building a service business series. So um, before I pass it over to Al to introduce Gary, I'm going to just give everyone the, the quick overview of Exit Advisors. Many of you have probably heard this before, but for those who have not, Exit Advisors is a uh, Houston-based M&A advisory group. We consult and help uh, entrepreneurs and seasoned business owners alike with their M&A transactions, exit strategy preparation, and ultimately looking to um, build a succession plan and, and exit their business. Most of the companies we look at are in the lower middle market, five to $50 million range. Um, and our goal is to really work with them months or years in advance to prepare them for that transaction, whether it's you know financial and accounting cleanup, um, operations, current state assessment, um, and then really finding the right buyer and the right fit for them. Um, and we also take a very collaborative approach with our, with our peers, uh, you know, whether it's a CPA, uh, financial planner, business attorney, that sort of thing. We like to partner with these types of service firms so that we can, you know, take a, a more collaborative approach on the transaction, um, utilize them in, in certain capacities, um, help educate and train and, and, and work together. Um, you know, to, to better the client. So um, that's a little spiel about us. I'm going to pass it over to Al now. Um, as and, and just as a reminder, as we as we go through the presentation, if you have questions, you can use the Q&A feature or the chat, um, whichever is easier or you prefer, and, and we'll uh, answer them during the Q&A at the end. Thank you, Andrew. Well, it's an honor to introduce Gary. And for those of you that know Gary, uh, he needs no introduction. But for those of you that don't need know Gary, he needs a little introduction, just some amazing accomplishments that he has in his life. Um, Gary's been a practicing CPA since 1978, where he started with Pete Marwick, which is now KPMG. Uh, over the years, he's held uh, numerous roles, including taking a company public as a CFO. Uh, Gary's built two multi-million dollar CPA practices. Um, He's a partner in Cooper CPA Group, and he's a managing member of Exit Advisors. Uh, he acquired a practice in Cypress, Texas. He owned it for four years, doubled the size, and sold it. So he knows something about uh, growing and running service uh, companies, which is the subject of today's, today's uh, presentation. Uh, a little about Gary's credentials. He's a certified valuation analyst. He's a forensic accountant. He's a mergers and acquisitions specialist. But... Uh, I think perhaps his most important credentials, he's a fantastic father to three great sons that he's raised. Uh, he's one hell of a drummer, and he typically puts his displays, uh, his skills on display once a month at the Exit Advisors Band Jam, which uh, I hope we get a chance to kick off here as soon as we get through the corona situation. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Gary, and, uh, and thank you, Gary, for your time and expertise today. Well, thanks for the great introduction, Al. I'd uh, I really appreciate it. I, I wish I was a hell of a drummer. I'm a kind of a hack and I try to sing, but the most important thing is I love doing it. And uh, I love, you know, having the band jam and bringing people together, uh, especially the local musicians and, and creating that environment uh, that, that really, really fosters happiness. And uh, that's important to me. Uh, you know, talking about uh, setting up a service business and organizing a service business is something, thank God I have a lot of experience at. I, I built my first CPA firm in uh, Dallas, Texas, and built it up to a reasonable size. And uh, then my wife informed me that we were moving to Houston. She said that, uh, you know, my family's congregated in Houston, so I think it's time for us to move there. And uh, the practice was already close to $2 million practice. And and uh, so what I did is I told her, I said, I tell you what, if we can sell the house in a week uh, for this particular price, I'm on. And we did it in like three days. So all of a sudden I found myself in Houston, Texas, sitting out in my backyard wondering how I was gonna create this business. Well, the last session we had a few weeks ago talked about the marketing side of it and the networking side of it. And, 
and how vital that is, especially digital marketing now and, and how you can really create a following and you can go out on Google and, you know, you, you can have clicks. You can also, uh, you know, put content out on your website, build a really creative website uh, with good landing pages and, and really get some organic activity. And then, of course, the networking side, I mean, you know, Exit Advisors is so good about collaboration and our network. And I think Andrew alluded to that, to where, you know, we have the attorneys and we have the risk management, we have the uh, advisors and such that really collaborate together uh, to help put together a sound transaction uh, to where we go out to the marketplace and we find a strategic deal uh, that's going to give you the best possible exit strategy. And uh, also, uh, you know, we've got a really good team of people with, with uh, Andrew and Casey and Al and John Maneri and, and some of the others involved in this. And uh, we have education in mind. And I, I think that's obvious with the town halls that we're having, uh, trying to reach out and help people, you know, gain an understanding of the business they have, business valuation. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to have talk about EOS, and which will be a really interesting topic. It's going to be delivered uh, by Jason Knight. But today, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to build a service company and some of the important aspects of that. And, and the first part this week is going to be talking about human capital. Uh, you know, when you have a service business, I think the people who are involved in your business are your business. And they're the ones that's going to be handling your customers or your clients. And uh, they're going to be the face of your company if you allow that. Ha having a flat organization chart, you know, where you can, uh, I know t Al talked last week about, you know, company-specific risk. And one of them is, is the owner being able to pull themselves out of the operations of the business and overseeing their business. Well, guess what? Human capital is what's really critical in that aspect. So first, let, let's just start out, you know, the hiring process, right? So the first thing a lot of people don't do is they don't profile the position. So they really don't take a step back and say, okay, what is this person going to do for us? Let, let's look 10 years out and let's re-engineer backwards. And where do I want this person to be on a 10-year basis? And, and how can I establish a foundation for a new hire to come in and be successful for themselves which is really important to consider and successful for the organization and putting them in the right seat. So profiling that position is critical. And then having a standard interviewing process. I, I know, you know, a lot of thoughts not put into this where, all right, what questions are we going to answer? What, what do we want to know about this person? You know, what, what type of referrals are we going to get when we go out and speak to others, uh, you know, to see if, if we're getting the right person in the right seat. And I know with us, when we interview someone at Cooper CPA Group, and even at Ex Advisors as well, we all meet that person. I find it really important that the entire team is able to talk to the person, tell the person whatever they want, you know, about the organization, let them be candid, transparent, and, and let everybody collaborate and decide, is this the right person that's going to be a team member? And, and here at Cooper CPA Group, we, we call them team members. They're not employees. And basically, the attitude is that we all work for the customer, okay? And most service businesses, that's the case. And you're, you're going to have a leader. You're going to have somebody that's, is, you know, managing the charge and handle things. But, but as far as we're concerned, they're team members. And then going right into creating the accountability chart. And so this is something that you're going to get from Jason next week, talking about putting the right person in the right seat. And so, you know, you may have the right person, but you may put, you may put them in the wrong seat. That's just like most businesses. Uh, you, you have the visionary and you have the integrator. And typically the visionary is the person out there with the vision, creating the plan, having great oversight, understanding where the company's going. And the integrator is the guy sitting there hammering, making things happen, managing the business. Well, if you try to put a visionary in, a, in the seat of an integrator, things just don't go well, and vice versa. Okay, uh, you know, that's why a lot of businesses fail 
that's not paying attention to the accountability chart. And it's an interesting process with some clients. We'll, we'll sometimes go out and, and we'll put all the positions that are necessary with running a company. And then we'll ask them, all right, write the person's name in each of the boxes that really handle this operational function. And it's amazing how the business owner's name shows up in so many boxes or the wrong person may show up in the box. So I think this accountability chart is really critical to establish. And, you know, with EOS, you, you have your operations person, you have your visionary, you have your integrator, you have someone in charge of sales, finance, and marketing. And then you try to fill those seats with the right people. Uh, okay, so turnover. Talk about this real quick. Turnover will kill a business, especially a service business. And I, I can speak, you know, from the accounting business that, you know, most of the clients that we pick up, it's because we hear, well, I talk to a different person every time I call or they don't return my phone calls. And so how do you hedge against that? Well, you don't have turnover and hiring people. We talked about the hiring process. You bring them in and then you have your core values. So a lot of businesses don't think about that. They'll think about a mission statement. You know, they, they really don't think about their vision and they don't think about the core values. And, and your team members need to embrace those core values. I say that, you know, 90% of the people that's ever terminated from our company is because they didn't embrace the core values. Uh, from a standpoint of, you know, communications, transparency, uh, client services, all of that is part of our core value process. And, and, you know, that needs to be well explained. And then people need to be nurtured, be brought along to embrace the core values. Uh, having a welcoming environment. Okay, I, I know we, we have a band room in this office and we have a lot of really cool stuff hanging on the wall, you know, beetle art and uh, rock and roll memorabilia, baseball memorabilia, but, but having a welcoming environment to where, you know, there, there's a smile on people's faces uh, is really critical instead of, you know, forced management to where you're, you're motivating your people through fear instead of, you know, motivating them to do things that are going to be beneficial for the company and make them and everybody happy. Okay, leadership versus management. This is kind of interesting. So, you know, a lot of times you say, well, the leader is, is a visionary and the manager is the integrator. But, but you know, it's a style. It, it's a style of leading people, bringing them along, pulling the noodle. Okay, and, you know, if there has to be a reprimand that's short, quick, and you do it one-on-one, -on -one, possibly with someone with you, and then you go on with your business. And, and just think, you know, just like in war and battle, the leader, this one that, that rallies the troops and gets them going and get them to do the things that need to be done to win the battle, well, it's the same thing, right? It's cre creating within your infrastructure, the people are sitting in the management seats, letting them be leaders as far as just managing detail. Uh, and then team members, they're just not employees, all right? They're just not a number. They got purpose. They got reason. Uh, you know, you're able to reward them based on the activity they produce. Uh, and then meetings, all right? So this is something that I really discounted at one time in my career was the weekly meetings. Uh, I think it's critical. And then I'll always go back and talk about EOS a little bit, which is off the book traction. and. Uh, Jason Knight, who is our implementer. But, you know, we do something called a level 10 meeting each week, and it takes an hour and a half. And first, it's management. So management will really, in that meeting, an hour of that meeting is resolving issues. And those issues, I mean, are resolved in the meeting. It's, it's not, you don't politic them, you resolve them, and you make decisions. And, and then we have a weekly staff meeting where all the staff is brought up, up to date with what's going on in the practice, uh, everybody talks about the work they have at hand, and uh, we find that critical. And exit advisors, I mean, we, we have a weekly meeting on Mondays to where we bring everybody up to speed. Uh, you know, we, the right hand knows what the left hand's doing. We know what projects are going on. And it's just really, really beneficial to get everybody on the same page. And then have an anonymous suggestion box. And it's something we put in place a couple of years ago. And really encourage your staff 
you know, to put something in that box. Uh, if there's something that's troubling them or they think there's something else that, that we could do to improve the environment, or improve our customer care, uh, put it in that box and, and take those suggestions to heart when you get them. Okay, benefits, right? So this is one thing that's it, a lot of small businesses who are clients, it's something they really, really discount. Uh, our company has benefits that's pretty comparable to a Fortune 500 company. And, you know, obviously competitive comp compensation is something, but, you know, medical insurance, group disability, and let me tell you what, for, for those of you who have small businesses, you can get group disability for your team cheaper than you can get individual disability insurance. And you're covering everybody. Uh, and then you've got a better disability policy for yourself. And it's something I highly recommend you look into. The 401k, I mean, this is something that, you know, it really, it builds continuity, it builds, it builds longevity and employment. And, uh, you know, using the safe harbor and having the 4% matching, I think it's, it's really important. It's really important to, to keep your staff on board. And then the little things, okay? It's really interesting. Some things like, you know, I buy lunch quite, a, quite often for my staff. I even wash their cars uh, typically once or twice a month. Uh, as Al mentioned earlier, we had a band jam, a party once a month that, you know, we, we would have very festive, have 100, 150 people show up and have beer and wine and star pizza typically. Uh, you know, recognizing people on their birthdays. I mean, we have a cake, uh, you know, card, a small gift, uh, you know, anniversaries, uh, anniversaries of people with you a year and, and further. Uh, you know, having that in place. And then I can't say enough about PTO. So, you know, having days off, having time, uh, we offer, a, I think, 14 holidays, three weeks of PTO, and people need to be rested. Uh, they, they need to have a, you know, be able to do their job. And if people are exhausted, and I, I know just like talking about CPA firms, they, they work their people to death uh, during busy season. And, and it just, to me, I think people start fading after 60 hours. And uh, I think it's just something that should be considered in your overall plan. And that goes along with having enough human capital, having enough, you know, employees, team members uh, involved in the organization, you know, to make sure the work is completed. And uh, I know we try to stay one employee overemployed all the time to where we can handle handle the service uh, of our clients. Okay, let's let's jump into tracking and accountability. And we've already talked about this a little bit on the accountability chart, putting the right people in the right seats. And so, you know, it's like putting a square peg in a round hole. And, and so you've got to, during the interview process and then during the process of, of developing your employees, you know, look at what their strong suits are. And uh, I coached a lot of select baseball when my kids were growing up and, and we played at the, at the major level. And, you know, one thing I did as coaching, I, I never tried so much to work on my players' weaknesses. I really focused on their strengths. I mean, if somebody was a really good shortstop, I didn't say, well, I want to make you a good catcher. Uh, you know, if somebody couldn't bunt, uh, they would hit. Uh, it, it's just the same thing in business. You, you look at people's strengths, and I know there's a book called Strength Finder, and there's other – you know, there's other literature out there on that. Another interesting book, The Freak Factor, that I've read that's interesting that talks about the uh, strengths and offsetting weaknesses. But, you know, you, you do that, you align your people properly, and you're going to get a lot more effectiveness instead of saying, well, this is your weakness, we're going to improve that. Uh, and then, you know, as I mentioned, creating an accountability chart. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Is it's making these making sure these people are in the right positions. And also your company, there may be a position your company requires. Uh, you know, just like when we added a marketing person here, it, it's really changed our world uh, to a you know, number of clients that we've received now and having somebody really focus on the digital marketing, the SEO uh, with our landing pages and such. 
Uh, and that was somebody that was added to the chart. So you've always got to look at, you know, what do I not have that I need, all right? Uh, you know, have your employees take responsibility for their task, right? Th this, this goes along with accountability as well and not allowing people to delegate up. I, and I know, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs allow that. They, they will, they, they'll come home at the end of the day and say, I did everything. Well, you did everything because you didn't delegate properly. And the old saying that if somebody else can do it, delegate it, well, I, I strongly believe in that. And I'll go back to the company specific risk where, you know, the valuation of a company, the, the one that really takes you out of the game is that you're doing everything instead of releasing. And there's a, comp a book called Built to Sell that's really good. It talks about that. And I would highly recommend you read that if you have a small business. But you really got to hold people accountable. People have got to take ownership. If they have a project, they have a client, uh, they have a task, they've got to take ownership to it and they got to see it through. And they, you know, sometimes that's not an easy thing to tell your employee you need to dig some more. You need to do some more research. I'm not going to give you the answer. Uh, you're only going to be developing someone to be a better person and a better team player. Okay. As far as accountability, daily, weekly, monthly reports, vital statistics of the business, right? So it's kind of like if you were to go to a Rockets game and you were watching the Rockets game and there was no scoreboard, okay? Would you have any idea how many points somebody had scored, what the score was? You just think about that scoreboard and the importance. I know that when I go to basketball games, I'm looking at everything, how many three points they've hit, you know, from the field and the paint, rebounds, statistics per player, you know, it's, it's really important. Well, you got to think of your business that way as well. I know daily, I'll get into this a little more, but, you know, I have a dashboard that I have my vital statistics. Uh, I get weekly reports. I get monthly reports and include a, what I call a monthly analysis, monthly audit uh, of, the, of the company. And this goes pretty far reaching, you know, with uh, production reports, realization reports, uh, you know, billable, non-billable time per employee. And, and so all this information helps make business decisions. It's not for file 13 to file my future tax returns or something that I pulled together just to give to the bank. Uh, now this accountability that's in place goes down, not just from the company itself, but per employee that you can see exactly what's going on. Uh, you know, this goes along with the individual scorecards. And so I know that we have it set up to where we met production, billing, realization, uh, and then the scorecards also lay out what they're responsible for, their clients, the task, you know, the responsibilities on each of the clients. And so that scorecard will really, it's like a job description in a sense, but it's easy to manage and monitor. And so you're able to see from an accountability standpoint that people are actually doing the job that they're supposed to be doing. And also you use the scorecard and use the results of this accountability uh, for result driven bonuses. So, you know, bonuses shouldn't always just be tied into production or billings. I mean, there's other tasks, especially that your administrative people are doing that they should be bonus for. Uh, you know, managing the receivables aging, making sure accounts don't get into the 90-day column. Uh, it, it can go on and on. I mean, number of phone calls taken, number of phone calls received. And the marketing side, you know, how many people are touching us? I mean, you know, what, how many people are calling in? How many people are staying on the website? So all that is going to be on the scorecard and people are going to be accountable, but then that can be used, you know, for result driven bonuses. And then, you know, reporting should be tangible and systematic uh, with expectations established. So, you know, you get into a cadence. So, and, and you require this reporting at, at certain intervals. That way, you know what to expect. Okay, you create expectation in your organization. People know what you want to see. They know when you want to see it. And, and if you don't have this somewhat regimented, it's going to get off tracks. 
because you know you as an entrepreneur and a business owner say well I, i'll just just give it to me next week can't do that you just got to keep it on a standard to where you receive that information timely and promptly okay internal reporting uh you know, I put this, make your practice come first when related to financial reporting, uh, planning and compliance. Now, I'll kind of relate to some CPA firms where they're always putting their clients first and uh, they forget about the reporting of their own organization. And, and so, you know, realistically, you're running a business, right? And you've got an organization that you got to make sure that is following processes and procedures. And we like to put our business first from a standpoint of the detail, the financial reporting, the contents of the financial information, reconciliation of financial information, production reports, the whole bit. So, I mean, if I ever had to go through a due diligence process myself, I think I would come out and do quite well uh, with information that needs to be looked at. And you got to put yourself in that position as well. What if somebody knocks on your door? I think Al refers to that a lot. You know, you're sitting back, you get the knock on the door, somebody comes in and says, hey, I'll buy you for 10 times. Well, that's 10 times your EBITDA. And guess what? Your infrastructure is a mess. Uh, your general ledger's not caught up. You don't have good, what they call non-financial reports you know, that really break out the statistics of your business and you're not able to sell your business. Let's say you have an opportunity come up to where you can buy another company, you can expand your horizon and you gotta go to the bank and you gotta pro provide the bank with information. Well, if you're not running it like a business and you don't have your financials up to date, you're not running accrual-based financial statements, so you really can't determine economic reality you don't have strong cutoffs. Uh, you know, you don't have vital statistics that, that the bank can look at. Well, you don't look like a well-managed business. So, uh, you know, obtaining that financing, it's not going to be possible. Same thing if somebody wants to partner up with you and they want to look at your information and you look at theirs. Well, you know, if you're not running your business like a business, you're just not going to have the information available to share and you know possibly cripple the deal and at exit advisors i mean the one thing that we do a lot of is succession planning for people and for businesses to, you know you can go ahead and you, you can build a, a data room you can start putting financial information in there you can start organizing yourself uh you know you can you can have a quarterly analysis to where you run like an mdna that you find in a public offering document you know, that explains what your business has done over the last quarter, year to date. And you start building that information up through your financial information, uh, you have a much better shot of selling your company down the road. So as I mentioned earlier, I get daily, weekly, monthly reports and they have vital statistics. And, you know, I can only refer to mine and I'll try to refer to other service businesses, but you know, for a CPA practice daily, you know, my dashboard is going to have my cash balance, my receivables, it's going to have my accounts payable, uh, aging uh, included, it's going to have production by employee. And, and so this daily information really keeps me on the pulse of the business. I know what we're doing. I know the numbers. Uh, it, it just, you know, I don't have to go ask a bunch of questions. I don't have to go beat on my administrator's doors and start asking them about cash balances and what we spent the previous week and day and what our collections has been. That, that daily dashboard really adds a lot of value uh, to me managing the business and plus not bothering my employees. Uh, you know, not go, having to go to them and knock on their door and disrupting their day. Uh, then on a weekly basis, it's kind of expanded. I, I get uh, accounts receivable aging, I get a payable aging, I uh, actually get uh, financial statements. I get balance sheets and income statements uh, month to date on a weekly basis, you know, to where I can see where we're at. They're compared to the previous year. So, you know, I can really measure where we are uh, at any given time. 
And then of course, the monthly reports uh, come off. I do what we call a monthly audit. And so that analysis encompasses all the financial statements, reconciling our working process, reconciling our accounts payable, reconciling our billings. Uh, it encompasses, I uh, have all my check registers. I can really look again at where my money's going. And, you know, look at realization where our, with our clients, if, if, you know, we're basically going out with our engagement letters and we're proposing too low of a dollar amount then you know, basically losing money. Uh, so those realization reports can be ran by client. It can be ran by employee. Uh, and so all that information on a monthly basis and plus it's comparable. So I also have on the month end audit, I have, for instance, this year I'd have 2019 and 2020. So I can really compare the two years and see where I stand and see what type of improvements we put in place and, and see the effects of those. Uh, so I, I just think, you know, having this information like this is it, so very critical to have to monitor your business. And then you get into larger companies and, and I know back, you know, when I was with larger companies, uh, New York Stock Exchange companies and such, uh, departmental reports. So if you've got a larger service business, you know, that's something that's really important as well. You have department managers and those departments should have those reports coming off uh, and they basically are monitored based on the individual scorecards uh, and the department scorecards. And that way, you know, if you're overseeing numerous departments, you have a budget, you have an activity-based report and you can monitor the results. Uh, once again, that can be used from an accountability standpoint. It can be used to monitor and it can also be used for bonuses. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, reporting should be tangible and systematic. So all the reporting should be set up uh, to where it's really not a multiple choice question. When reports come out, you got to hold the people accountable that produce them. And you got to hold yourself accountable because it's really important that you look at those reports and you ask questions because it's like anything else. If they know you're not looking, they're going to, they're going to lighten up. They're not going to be as, you know, fast to give good detailed statistics to you if they think you're just throwing in a trash can. And so you've got to be able to look at this information as well. Uh, I know we're, we're finishing a little sooner, but we do, we do have some questions on these topics. And uh, Andrew, if, if you can start throwing some of the questions out, let me elaborate on them, that would be great. Yeah, Gary, uh, we've got a few questions and, and we've um, got some from David Acosta and I know you'd love to hear from him. So I'm gonna try to get him on to, uh, to speak. Right, David, is your mic available? I'm here. You hear me? Yeah. Hey, David. What's up? Yeah, I love what you're doing, brother. Well, thank you. I, I, I'd asked you a question earlier about the, um, it, it wasn't about this particular topic, it was about the prior topic about when you, you get clients in different areas, how do you keep up with where they're coming from and whether or not whatever you're doing is, is working and so you can gear your resources towards the ones that are working and just reduce the resources to the ones that ain't working. You all talk about that on a regular basis about whether or not you're, you're for instance, is the band jam working? Is the, the website working? Is your emails working? How do you keep up with what's working and what's not? You know, David, that's that's an interesting question, and and yes, we do. It's it's something. Uh, I have a really good marketing person. I have a, a really good customer care person uh, that works with us and on our team, and it's something that's discussed in our level ten meeting each week. And uh, we actually have company scorecards. Uh, so our company scorecard will basically tell us in that level ten meeting how many new clients we've added where they've come from. Uh, also, Taylor puts together a report, a weekly report that basically shows how many people have come to our website, how many clicks we've received. Uh, and then Maureen, who's in customer care, well, she's the one that's making all the phone calls and setting the appointments. 
So we know exactly, you know, if it's coming from our website, if it's coming from clicks, if it's coming from organic, uh, we also know if it's coming from client referrals uh, to where we try to provide a gift for our clients to refer business to us. Uh, and, and so I, I think we've got a really vivid understanding of that. And I think it's critical that you do know that because, you know, the old saying that, that uh, you know, basically 80% of your business may be coming from, you know, 20%. Uh, so it, it's, it's important to know. Uh, as far as tracking, you know, retention, I mean, we definitely track the uh, client retention as well and, and try to measure. I, I also want to elaborate too is, is the website itself, our landing pages, we try to hold ourselves out as being the CPA firm for entrepreneurs. And so our landing pages and such as that, it, we're really trying to direct our attention to that. And uh, so we monitor that too, how many small business we get, and then we'll, we'll tweak our digital advertising based on that. Thanks, man. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I, I just, I was just trying to get to the point where maybe you had some kind of system or on, on your, on your, on your, dashboard that just showed you that really quick uh, or, or is it just something that you compile from different sources like, like you, you mentioned that you get different people telling you different things but if you had it like in one spot one place where you can just go right to it and it would tell you everything that's going on well I, and I think Taylor does have that information definitely from the digital side and then Maureen will definitely have the information from a standpoint of the client referrals and then, you know, we'll monitor things like when we do our email blast, what kind of results we get from that. And you mentioned the band jam. The band jam is something that's, you know, we looked at that from a marketing standpoint of just being exposure, being a differentiator. And I know I've gotten some clients from it. And, and I know even Exit Advisors has gotten some hits uh, from the band jam. Uh, and so it's, it's really good exposure. But most importantly, is that differentiator. That, you know, you can say, well, a lot of my competition says that they think outside of the box. Well, I have proof of it, uh, you know, from an artistic standpoint. Great. I appreciate it, man. And, uh, you want me to go ahead and ask you that second question? And then yeah, and I'll David, get out of the way. David, real quick, too. If you tune in, you'll see on the screen next week, Jason Knight, who we've been partnering with, what the heck is a business operating system? He does a lot of this. Gary kind of alluded to it, these level 10 meetings and your, your milestones and rocks. Um, Gary's implemented with his firm. Exit Advisors is kicking it off ourselves right now. And as far as having that kind of dashboard or that snapshot of where you stand with certain things, whether it's client sourcing or deliverables, um, he'll get into a lot of that too. So you'll, you'll see some of that next week. Um, yeah, but go I'll ahead and tune into that. What's that? I said, I'll tune into that. Yeah, please do. And, and go ahead, uh, finish off your second question. Yeah, it was, uh, you, you mentioned how you take care of your client. I mean, your, 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 your team members. I don't want to call them employees, but you get very close to them. How do you keep that line separation where you're not too close to them, where it, it, it blurs the line of your, you know, being their friend and being their boss? What do you do to stop yourself from getting, crossing that line? You know, I, I think it has to do with being authentic. I, I think it has to do with having a kind heart. And I, I think that's a couple of things that I do well. I mean, there's a lot of things I certainly don't do well. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, you know, it, it's a matter of we don't go out and socialize. Uh, you know, I never go to lunch one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, with one of my staff level people and they understand their responsibility and I think that goes along you know with having the accountability chart having the right people in the right seat and establishing expectations and it makes it really easy to lead people like that because they know it's expected of them and and I think it's being caring also I think it's giving people time off it's listening to them. It's when they have an issue, I have a problem, I have an open door. Uh, 
I don't, I don't push any questions to the side. I try to answer them with an open mind and an open heart. And, uh, and, and I think that's what fosters uh, us not having turnover and having very, you know, a lot of closeness. I mean, we, we have a very close team here. And David, you've worked here. I mean, you know that everybody gets along well. And, and, and that goes along, we talked about at the very beginning, the hiring process. You know, if you hire a jackass, you're going to end up having problems in your organization. And if you hire somebody that, if you, if you hire the, the round peg and try to put it in a square hole, and it's just not going to work. And so, you know, you bring team members in, and that's why in the, in the interviewing process, too, that everybody in the team talks to the new potential team member. And uh, I got to tell you, man, we've, we've had people blackball this come through the interviewing process. You know, and it's not by me. It's by staff level person. So I, I think all of that combined is what creates a solid team where everybody gets along and you, you don't have to be overly friendly and be their buddy. You can still be their boss. Sounds great, man. Thanks. Hey, Gary, so we, we had some other questions that were submitted. I'm going to get into those now. Um, okay. and Folks, as you listen in, if you have questions, use the, the chat or the Q&A uh, tool. Um, but on the, on the subject of, you know, that culture, what is the significance of having transparency in your organization? And does that help with turnover and, and, and whatnot? You know, Andrew, I, I think it's critical. I think uh, people need to know what's expected of them. And they also need to know if something is not going in the right direction. And I can't tell you how many times over my career that, you know, someone would, you know, not me, but somebody may have reprimanded somebody in a very harsh way. And then they lose them. And, you know, you've got to be able to sit down and really uh, tell somebody what they've done wrong, why it's wrong, and how they can improve it. And you do it short and sweet. And, you know, you're totally transparent with them. And then you do a follow-up, you know, in 30 days. Well, let's say that they've improved in the next 30 days. Well, this is what a lot of leaders don't do. And you sit down with that person and say, you know something, you've really improved. I've seen a complete turnaround in your attitude. I've seen a complete turnaround in the work that you're doing. And I really appreciate it. And, and, Employers don't say that enough to their employees. And also the meetings we have, the, the management meeting and the staff meeting, I mean, there's complete transparency. There's, you know, we're totally authentic with one, one another. And if we're having a problem with something that's going on within the organization, it's discussed and it's brought out. And, you know, the, the box that's set up where people can put information in if they're having a problem, if they want to see a change or a correction, then, you know, that anonymous box, man, it, it, you take that and you take it to heart. You bring it to the management meeting and you make sure something's done about it. And I can tell you every, every time something's been put in that box, it's been addressed at the management meeting and it's been addressed at the staff meeting and we do something to make an improvement. And I think if people see that, they know the importance of the transparency. So then in return, they're transparent. That, yeah, good point. And, and I have one more here that's going to fit into the whole theme of, of employee culture. Um, what are some employee benefits, you know, big or small, that seem to have a real impact on, you know, on the employees and on the culture? You know, I, I think the little things, I mean... It's gotten to the point, I think, where people kind of expect, you know, medical insurance. They, they expect PTO. Uh, they expect certain holidays. But, you know, you expand the holidays, right? So you, instead of Fourth of July, instead of one day, you give two days. Thanksgiving, instead of two days, you give three days. Uh, last year at Christmas, we gave off the week between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, I think going a little bit, beyond what's expected and uh, we'll do that I, I think little things like you know something that's inexpensive as washing your staff's cars or 
buying lunch. I mean, I don't buy one, lunch just one time a week. It's typically two or three times. And it's, it's not that expensive. And, and plus, you know, let's face it, it keeps people in the office. It keeps them working. Uh, but they really appreciate it. And then I mentioned the group disability earlier, you know, I, that's really been beneficial, especially with some of our female employees who's had children. I mean, it's kicked in and it's, and it's paid them. I mean, it, it's, it's been a very tangible benefit for, for several people in the office. Uh, and, and, you know, I just think the little things like acknowledging the anniversaries, acknowledging the birth dates, uh, and, and you know something, when you get, when a client responds positively to someone's work, it's really announced, it's, it's, they get shout outs, and uh, that, that really makes a difference. Yeah, those are some, some great uh, ways to, to boost the morale too. And I, I think it just, it comes down to, you know, people don't necessarily have to be glued to their seats uh, to do good work. They just need to be, you know, happy in the work that they do. So, yep. Um, yep. well, here, here's another uh, little bit more of an operational question. What are some strategies that you have found that are effective for putting people in the right seats? Well, I'll go back to the interviewing process, but then I'll also focus again on the strengths. So you, you really got to understand the personalities and there's personality tests that can be taken that are very helpful and understanding what makes somebody tick. Uh, you know, and what really comes down to what makes people happy. Like, you know, if somebody is, is not a very good detail person, they don't want to do a bunch of detailed bookkeeping right? But, but they may have a good operational mind and they may be really set to do M&A work, you know, to set up a data room. And so I think it's focusing on the strengths of the person. And, and then you got to acknowledge too, that if you just absolutely have the wrong person, let's say in an accounting practice, if you have somebody who's just not good at numbers, <laughs> you know, there may not be a seat for them. Uh, and, and so I really think it goes back to to not trying to make to improve everybody's weaknesses, to foster their strengths, and and I think you know two you have defined seats, and that's something that people fail to do. They they have on their org chart they don't even have the defined seats, so you've got to have a clear picture of what the job description is before you can even some put somebody in that seat. Uh, you know, and you look at that job description and you really define what it's going to take for somebody to really thrive and, and do the 100%. And, and I think that's a failure on a lot of business owners that they don't do that. What a, let's dive a little deeper into accountability. Um, I know you touched on it earlier with, you know, with David and talking about scorecards, but how do you track it? What's the best way to do it? And, and, I guess how do you how do you manage motivation versus accountability? Well, I mean, you know, David was wondering, like, on the advertising and marketing, and does it all come in one place? And you know, for us as an accounting practice, uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, we have production reports, we have realization reports. Uh, you know, we're able to track people's hours. I mean, you know, it's. Keeping up with your hours is never a lot of fun, but, but we can tell when somebody's billable and non-billable. And, and so that accountability is pretty simple in a CPA practice. Uh, some service industries, insurance and such, I mean, obviously you're dialing for dollars and you know, the percentage of, of people that you call, the percentage of people you set appointments in, the percentage of people you sell, you know, they're, they're all measurements. Uh, of accountability and, and keeping track of that. And then, you know, it's real simple with, with the motivation and with the bonuses, like, you know, for instance, at our practice, I mean, we look at, we look at their billings, we look at their production, and we start out each month with a monthly budget. So we have a budget that has really defined uh, what type of production, production we expect out of each employee based on hours. And uh, then at the end of each month, we're able to see if people are on track. And then we do a quarterly bonus uh, with the production. 
Well, you know, the administrative staff has to do with hours work, it has to do with collections, it has to do with monitoring accounts receivable, set up of new clients, uh, follow up with new clients, the speed engagement letters come in. And so, you know, there's ways to really monitor as well, uh, you know, what, what those people are doing also. And then you tie the bonuses to that. It's an activity-based bonus. And so, you know, you keep people accountable, but they get awarded for it. Uh, you know, they don't get reprimanded for not being accountable. And that, that goes back to the transparency part where if somebody's not meeting their standards, I mean, we talk to them and we, we try to find out what's really going on, you know, what, why they're not meeting those standards. If there's a hiccup that they don't have enough work or if there's something that we can do to, to make it uh, more fluid for them. Awesome. Well, thanks, Gary. Um, I'm going to, you know, I was going to close it up, but I, I think since you've done so much with Jason Knight and his operating system, um, why don't you give a quick little overview of what what's to come next week and, and share okay. your closing remarks? That'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, the book Traction was written by Gino Whitman, and then there were some other books that came out subsequent to that called Rocket Fuel and Get a Grip. Uh, that really go into EOS, which is the uh, Entrepreneur's Operating System. And I initially read the book Traction and outlined it and really thought I could implement it myself. And I did half-heartedly. Uh, then I met, uh, well, Lamar Matthews is also a member of EO and, and she really helps uh, go in and, and on the integration side and does a very good job. And I had her come in and, and really interview each of my employees and the management level and find out, you know, why people write seats. And then we, we were lucky enough to get Jason, who is our implementer. And uh, the EOS system does an incredible job with being able to define your core values, uh, define who your customer is, what kind of business that you want, you know, to bring into your company. It puts the right people in the right seats. And then it holds all those people accountable and it really differentiates the, the visionary from the integrator. So I can tell you, since we started EOS, it makes it a lot easier for me to say that's not my job. And, uh, you know, we have people who are responsible for operations, uh, people responsible for marketing, sales, uh, financial administration. And it just is a really good system. It's a simple system that puts the people out there and holds them accountable. And then it's easy, as we mentioned earlier in this, as this talk, uh, you know, a basis to reward. And, and I highly recommend you being on for Jason next week. He, he's a very accomplished businessman and uh, really has incredible knowledge on this operating system. Well, thanks, Gary, and, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, yeah, be sure to tune in next week and, and each week afterwards. We've got some great topics lined up. Um, we love having you, and, and we love your questions, so keep the questions coming as well. Um, but we'll, we'll close it up for today, and, and we'll see you all next week, same time. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it, brother. See you later. Stay safe.